Okay, we're waiting to start. Re still, we're waiting. No, no, I just we Mitch started. told me to wait. He's like, just wait, and I didn't want to listen to him, so we started earlier than we anticipated. Mitch's iron fist rules no more. You have been usurped. All we know is we are back. It's Friday, March 13th, 19th. I was going to say, it's not that. Holy shit, I'm six days behind. I have no idea. 2021. Just in case you thought you slept a whole year, uh, you didn't. You're fine. Well, whatever it's 2021. happened. Yeah. Um, if you're listening to this in the future, I would highly advise that you uh, you know, send us an email and tell us how the future is. Yeah. We probably won't get that I mean, email why today. Not? Yeah, but start a cult at gmail.com. We are starting a cult, by the way. Us. That's Grant. I'm Jake. Mitch is here. It is true. We're back for another Friday. We decided here that, you know, we wanted a nice a nice week where we could have some fun and it doesn't need to be so uh so necessarily story driven, you yeah. know. Yeah. So we are, if you couldn't tell by the presumed title that this episode will be named i wonder what it'll be we're going to be talking about cursed objects and not necessarily just objects we got many different facets of thing here we're going to discuss yeah, the name of the doc that i have is cursed shit that's fair we might have to name it that i um yeah we we've done some things we have all different types of art that is uh cursed and why it might be cursed potentially um, so let's, uh, let's just begin, let's, shall yeah, we? I think you should go first. You want me to go first? Go get it on in there. Okay, well, I'm going to start with some of the easy ones. I'm going to ease this in. Uh, I did, a, I have three movies, so I'm just going to start with one, okay? Okay, all right. I had a couple movies, and I got some other things we will get into later. But, um, the big, the big one, you know, when you look up online, cursed, uh, objects, cursed things... When you start to kind of dive into it, you're going to see pretty much any movie that deals with the supernatural has some type of claim that uh, well, yeah. they're cursed on the set of the film. Yeah. Um, most of these are, are coincidental. If I mean, you know, they could all be coincidence if that's what you believe, perhaps. But uh, th there's a couple out there that really do have some questionable things that occurred to either the people working on the movie or people that have seen the movie. There's one of them. I think I have a guess for one of them. I'm just going to keep it to myself until you go through it. That's fine. The first one I will start with is The Exorcist, only because it's one of you know, the it's... very accessible ones out there. Yeah. You know. So what exactly happened on the set of The Exorcist that believed it to be cursed? Well, let me tell you this. The movie is about none other than demonic possession by a grand old demon named Pazuzu. Yeah. Um I maybe I'm making this up, but I'm pretty sure he's like the harbinger of the northeast winds or something. He really has no he's not like the devil, you know. Yeah, I wouldn't question it if you called him that. He's it's some like weird authority he has. <laughs> Somewhere in the bureaucracy of hell, he's he's up there. But either way, um, the movie revolves around a demon being undug or dug up uh, in the Middle East, and it gets into the body of a young woman named Regan. You're right. We have confirmation on his title too. Well, is it the Northeast? It is, yes. What, well, what is it, Mitch? It's something like that, I think. Well, he is uh, the king of the demons of the wind. Oh, so, okay. Uh, in in the ancient Mesopotamian religion. I Okay, cool. Yeah, that's close enough. That's close enough. Mine was just a little too specific. Um, So, I'm just giving you a rundown of the movie here in case you've never seen it. I'm assuming you It's a great you movie. You should totally watch it. Um, hilarity ensues when the demon possesses the woman and, you know, things are flying. There's colorful vomit. There's hilarious swear words. There's yeah, things are being action. said. Just gruesome, terrible, awesome, great. So what Fantastic. happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. For starters, early into the production of filming The Exorcist, the entire set of the movie was burned to the ground in an electrical fire. The only part of the set that survived was the bedroom of the little girl who was possessed by the devil. And 
I tried to kind of look up uh, geographically on the lot where the room was, and I couldn't get a definitive answer. But it seems that uh, the set that was the room, uh, it was not separated from the other parts of the set. It was just, you know, a door over. And it's just weird that that is the only... That is uh, strange. The yeah. only part of the set that did not burn to the ground. I feel like things being repellent to fire is like a theme we're going to have in this oh, episode. A little bit, yeah. A little bit. Um, so we have a lot of different things. Uh, the man who played the main priest in the film, he fell down the stairs and fractured his neck while filming. Uh, he did not die. He survived. He's fine. Um <laughs> Just a fractured neck. There are a couple different, uh, like, stagehands. I guess, I don't know if they're called stagehands. I guess they'd, they'd be... Yeah, they just work there. They'd be, yeah, they'd be, like, assistants. Uh, there are multiple reports of assistants uh, falling, things falling on them. Uh, one scolded themselves uh, with hot coffee. <laughs> and proceeded to sue McDonald's for millions. Um, the majority of the actors that were seen in scenes together, i.e. being the priest, uh, Regan, and the mother, they all contracted a horrible strain of the flu uh, from some oh, reports. Wow. That's what I've heard. Um, all around, it just wasn't really a good experience. And then to cap this off, uh, opening night, uh, 1973, I believe, was opening night. Um in Rome, it aired during a thunderstorm with massive bolts of lightning. And it is supposedly said that there was a woman in Rome in the theater that at a flash of lightning and a crackle of thunder, the power had flickered off, and she fell, she stood up, she fell over, and broke her jaw while watching the movie. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, now... The reason I started with The Exorcist is because I most of these are uncorroborated reports. These are just kind of things that happened. Uh, you know, things happen all the time. I mean, people burn themselves I mean, with coffee every yeah, day. Yeah, you're right. Um, I under you know I understand the fire is a little questionable. Um, the fact that somebody you know fell down the stairs and broke their neck. If you've ever seen the movie. Uh, the stairs I'm referring to are the very stairs that he dies on at the end. Yeah, they're very long, uh, they're jagged very stairs. Joker esque stairs. Yeah, um, the whole dance and jig. But so that I mean, even that that's it's a little suspect, but it's not necessarily fact. Uh, it's just coincidental. Yeah, and the old woman falling and breaking her jaw. I feel like old people tend to fall pretty often. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of the times when they fall, they're pretty much on their way out. Because yeah, uh, they sure. don't usually recover. But uh, the reason I wanted to bring it up is just because it's... I mean, it's its hard not to. It's one of the biggest things out there. You have to talk there. about it, yeah. Um, but I think, personally, I think the majority of this is just coincidence. Um, I don't know uh, of any truly negative things happening by that. I mean, death. Um, that's a little different. You know, like that's I didn't when it gets break weird. his neck, though. That's... That, yeah. that is no small thing. But um, I think it's just easy to grab onto The Exorcist and say that it's cursed because of what it is, you know? Yeah, and I mean, it's so mass-produced. Like, everyone's probably seen it at least once, and, like, something bad has happened either before or after. Mm -hmm. You know? True. You know? I, uh, so that's so why popular. I, that is why I chose to throw that one out first, because, you know, I wanted, to, I wanted to throw the softball out there first. You know, you get you them, loosen them up. Let you guys know what we're in for. Just maybe a little interesting detail you might not have picked up on. So what do you what do you got over there, Mr. Jake? We're yeah, going yeah. to a different art form direction. Yeah, you know what? I have uh, I have two paintings to talk about today. Ooh. So you want me to do the long one or the short one to begin here? I want you... Whichever one you feel. I'm going to do the long one because that's the first one that's on here. Sounds like a plan to me. All right. All right. So this painting is said to be... Like it's frequently billed as the most haunted painting in the world. It's called Who knows, man? What other paintings you got? What either? Uh, we got uh, the hands resist him. It's called right. It's okay, called the while hands you resist the him. hands resist him, I'm gonna look these up while you. It's terrifying, dude. Okay, so I, wanna, uh, I just want to put a, a you know a face to the name for yeah. a sake. Can you give me the name one more time? The hands resist him, and it's by a guy named Bill Stoneham. 
Oh, okay, here we go. The hands. Stone him, but just so you can type it in. Holy fuck. Ooh, it's it's fucking spooky shit. This looks like some John Podesta shit. Right? You know, dude. like, this is some weird, <laughs> creepy... Ooh, dude, what did, a, ooh. Dude, dude, yeah, we'll post these on the socials after uh, we I post don't like this, this episode. But I don't like this. There's a little background in it. There's it, some lore here. It's baby Peyton Manning and dead Betty Crocker You're is damn what right. I'm looking <laughs> at. <laughs> so you notice the background in the windows? Ooh, oh, oh I like yeah. This. I don't like this at all. Okay. All right. It's so venom. The hands resist him. It's said to be the most cursed haunted painting in the world. Uh, it's by Bill Stoneham. And uh, in 1972, Bill was, like, contracted to do two paintings per month for this gallery in California for this guy named uh, Charles uh, Feingarten. Man, that's that's quite the turnaround. Two paintings two a paintings month. Two paintings in a that's, month, dude. That's crazy. That's a, Like, wow. high quality and shit. But uh, so for one, for one of these, like, deadlines that he was uh, having to meet coming up, he decided to paint himself as, like, a five-year-old kid accompanied by... As you saw, one of the most terrifying little girl dolls that I've ever seen. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. not a good one. Uh, but anyway, so both are depicted standing in front of a glass panel door with disembodied hands reaching out from the darkness and reaching for and pressing against the glass. Mm. Very spooky. All right, again, we'll post these later. But, um, so Bill Stoneham himself claims that the doorway represents... Uh, the barrier between the waking world and the dream world. And the little girl doll is the one who's going to guide him through it all. If that was my guide, <laughs> I don't think I'd want to go on the trip. I'm just saying. I don't... I. Uh, yeah. It's hard. It's hard to be... I don't want to interact with something that is that terrifying to look at. No, and especially the eyes. Or it, more specifically, the absence of eyes. I mean, I'm it's sure. Not good. I'm sure she has a really beautiful personality, but I'm, <laughs> what do you think her voice is like? Like, ah, uh, come through the door. Come with me. <laughs> like, <laughs> Just oh. super like you. You got to come over here. Ah, uh, either way. Uh, a little background on the title of it. Stoneham's wife, apparently, who, at the time, because it was his first wife. Uh, she oh was yeah, a, she divorced him. Probably. Because uh, he painted this fucking weird picture. Hey, man. she That's, ugh. Here's the whole thing, dude. She wrote a poem, because she was a poet, uh, about him. Because, I don't know if I said this before, but it's five-year-old him in, in the painting. Um, she wrote a poem about him at this time in his childhood, about how he was adopted and he never knew his biological parents. It was a very poignant poem. You should look it up. But, um, so apparently that's where he got the title. And he's like, this is me dealing with the reality of being adopted. But uh, of the hands, Stoneham says that the hands were all of the possibilities. You were left with the question, are these disembodied hands? Are they dismembered? Uh, just floating there in space? Or are they connected to bodies? Crazy. So it's a spooky-ass painting. He did it for the Fane Garten uh, Gallery in Beverly Hills. It got put up. You know, you know I gotta say, I gotta say, after hearing... Uh, the, all this information about it—it's actually kind of cool. It is cool, yeah. It, the background gives it some cool. Uh, without the background, it's terrifying. I kind of like it now. Like it's definitely creepy as hell. But it—it's—it's it's, <laughs> it's it's a, me. it's a really cool idea. Like it I, is. I, I he's take a cool back artist, what I said. man. That's really interesting. No, yeah, he's a cool guy. So, so the painting went up in Fane, Fane Garten uh, Gallery in Beverly Hills, California, and was eventually. Uh, even recognized by a notable art critic named Henry Seldes. I, I don't know his name, but if I don't know who art, that is. If you're an art fan out there, let us know about Henry, Harry Sel or Henry Seldes. Henry Seldes. Yeah, sure. But anyway, so he was talking about it in the local newspapers. Also, while being displayed, the painting caught the eye of John Marley. Who do you know that guy is? Yeah, Bob's brother. Who's that? I, oh, Bob Marley. Yeah. No, oh, it wasn't on. that. How, oh, wasn't that okay, my head is completely in the Godfather because this is the man who found the head of the horse in his bed. Oh, really? That's okay. the actor who played that guy. Yeah. Yeah, um, he was the Hollywood asshole. Because <laughs> he well, got what he deserved, you know. Oh yeah. He oh, really yeah. did. Uh, he he purchased it, right? Uh, he loved it so much in that gallery, he purchased it. And within the same year of its debut, three people who came into contact with the painting died. Seldis, who was the fucking uh, critic, uh, Fane Garten, the guy who owned the gallery, and Marley, the actor who purchased it. They all died within that same year. Pretty spooky. 
And then uh, the painting just sort of disappears for like 26, 27 years. Okay. It just like it's off the face of the planet. Yeah, you know, until sometimes it, things just disappear. <laughs> sometimes things are just gone until the year 2000 uh, because they found it behind a brewery turned into an art gallery in California. Uh, who found it, you ask? It was an elderly couple. Uh, and it was by February of that year, because they found it somewhere in January, mm-hmm. that they made a decision to sell it on eBay uh, with a pretty insane description alongside it. Do you want to hear the description? I do. Underneath this painting? It's all in caps. All right. When we received this painting, we thought it was really good art. A picker had found it abandoned behind an old brewery. And HTE, I think it's supposed to say the. And the time we, at the time we wondered a little while, a seemingly perfectly fine painting would be discarded like that. Today we don't. Three exclamation points. Uh, one morning, our four and a half year old daughter claimed that the children in the picture were fighting and coming into her room during the night. Now, I don't believe in UFOs or Elvis being alive, but my husband was alarmed. To my amusement, he set up a motion-triggered camera for the night, for the nights. After three nights, uh, there were pictures, there were pictures. The last two pictures shown are, <laughs> are from, uh, from that stakeout. After seeing the boy seemingly exiting the painting under threat, we decided the painting has to go. Please judge for yourself before you do read this, the following... <laughs> warning and disclaimer warning do not bid on this painting if you are susceptible to stress related disease faint of heart or unfamiliar with supernatural events by bidding on this painting you agree to release the owners of all liability in relation to the sale or any events happening after the sale that might be contributed to this painting this painting may or may not possess supernatural power that could impact or change your life however by bidding you agree to exclusively bid on the value of the artwork with disregard to the last two photos featured in the auction and hold the owner's harm the owner's wait a minute and hold the owner's harmless in regard to them and their impact expressed or replied now that we got that out of the way one question to you ebayers we want our house to be blessed after the painting is gone gone does anyone know who is qualified to do that this sounds like it was written by the extremely coherent version of Charlie from It's Always Sunny. Yeah, there's there's only uh, there's a lot of periods in places there shouldn't be. A lot of just a lot of weird misspellings. grammatical decisions. Yeah, I like it. I like it. It's, it's <laughs> I'm unique. not one to believe in UFOs or Elvis being alive. That was my favorite part. I don't think he's alive. I don't think so, but this painting is fucked up. Yeah, dude, they're saying their kids are saying that these fucking kids in the painting are coming out of the painting at night and being fucking annoying or something. Yeah, I mean, it's I can cr- see why that would be a bit annoying. You know? Yeah, you know, like, why? Well, well, get back in the painting. All right, so this description brought a lot of attention to the post, okay? So with, uh, with many people's experiences simply viewing the painting. Um... Many claim to feel immediately nauseous, dizzy, faint, or terrified upon seeing it, even on the internet. All right. Uh, some even claim that their children would run away screaming upon seeing it, and that infants would cry in its very presence. Ugh. <laughs> oh, oh, children crying. But uh, so that uh, some that attempted to download and print the image had their computers and printers uh, mysteriously malfunction. And some claim to hear disembodied voices, feel phantom gusts of hot wind, even feel like hands touching them. And in some cases, they just like zone out for extended periods of time uh, while or after uh, viewing the painting. Interesting. So lots of strange things, even coming from just looking at it on the internet. Uh, oh, and I have, uh, I will also be posting a picture that they said was caught by a still frame camera that is fucking crazy looking. Let's see it. Look at that thing. Ugh. It's, it looks, it's like a little, the little that fucking like girl holding a gun. Dead. It does. It's oh, fucking oh. terrifying. I don't like that. Get rid of that. <laughs> Get yeah. it out of here. I'll turn it around. I'll turn it around. Uh, so regardless of this, however, the painting got over 30 bids on eBay, uh, eventually being sold to Kim Smith of Perception Gallery in Grand Rapids, Michigan for 
and $25. That's a uh, pretty nice piece of change for a, a creepy fucking nothing. Yeah, I mean, but the, yeah, the uh, the message did say that you have to bid on the value of it as just an art piece. They're like, that's one of the rules, even though all this creepy shit is going on. But anyway, so uh, so Smith received it uh, and just hung it up in the gallery, and uh, almost immediately a barrage of emails regarding how to deal with the painting's haunted nature, including multiple quotes of scripture, as well as a resident's uh, cleansing advice from a Native American shaman in Mississippi that all started just pouring into the inbox. All these crazy things, people are just like, you're going to die. But uh, <laughs> You're going to die. <laughs> you're going to die. But So the painting to this day is said to repulse and make physically ill and cause some viewers to suffer from blackout mind control experiences that is in quotations um so yeah that's the painting okay. that the hands resist him it's got a it's quite the lore okay okay i like that Where's the, painting now? the painting right now is still in in uh grand rapids michigan yeah all right well hopefully they're still okay hopefully man I that's the thing about some of these cursed stories that we're gonna share with you tonight is that in most cases, when it's over, it's just kind of over. Like yeah. you know, it just it just happens. You know, it's someone like, was like, "What do you do?" That's the thing about paintings; they're so misbehaved. Just stay in the painting, stay in there. How do you? Well, that's some special paint. I don't know the fact. I don't that know what kind of paint that. it is. Yeah, it's maybe acrylic, oh. some oil base. Well, Jesus fucking Murphy. <laughs> I'm gonna switch us yeah. back into film. I got two left. All right, so we're we gonna some go filmography. We're saving the big Kahuna for last, with the film, obviously, because it's the good one. We're gonna get into Rosemary's Baby, the oh, originator. I could, oh, yeah, I could see that. The originator. Um, for those of you that haven't seen it, it's essentially uh, it's about a woman who has a child with her husband, and it turns out to be the son of Satan, and. Uh, there's a pretty graphic scene where Satan, uh, you know, impregnates her. and uh, There's a lot of illusion in that movie, though. You know, it doesn't really, like, show it. They never show the kid. They do show the, the sex. The I demon I, sex. I think I need to rewatch it, then. It's, it's I don't strange. remember that, quite quite frankly. Um, Yeah, it's not like... It's not even really softcore porn. It's more uh, like a window... Or a, a shadow view, I should say. But you know, it's the it's illusion. Inferred. It's yeah, inferred. Yeah. yeah, it's like in the thirties when they would just like close the door on a couple. Then yeah. they'd just be like walking out the next morning. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh they fuck. Totally they boned. just boned. <laughs> um so Rosemary's baby uh predates the Exorcist. This was in nineteen sixty nine. And essentially it's a it's this one's a little bit it's got a little bit more meat on its bones than the Exorcist did. Uh, because one of the producers of the film, William Castle, uh, he believed that the entire set was cursed. And he believed this while they were on set. He mentioned that to other people working with him. Weird thing to say, right? I would be suspicious of that guy. <laughs> um, so, right after they finished filming, uh, the composer of the film, he fell. And he knocked his head and he was in a coma for a couple weeks until he never woke up. He died. Wait, the composer is in, like, the guy who wrote the music? Yeah. Okay. Uh, then William Castle himself, the individual that had mentioned this earlier, uh, he had an ex- he had extreme gallstones that required immediate surgery, and if oh, they were not shit. taken care of, it is believed that he might not have survived if it didn't happen as quickly as it did. And now we get to the very interesting question. The director of the film was none other than Mr. Roman Polanski. And we all know his wife's name was Sharon Tate, who was murdered by the Manson family in in her house. How about that? Yeah. Um. So this raises a question. This is two movies in a row now that are dealing about um, supernatural, more specifically demonic energy. Uh, things of that nature, and we're dealing with very, very strange deaths, uh, illness, things of that nature, and the question becomes, is this coincidence? Now, we have two examples. Now, I understand there's a lot of people that work on a movie, 
Um, I would say in a given year, one person that worked on a movie is going to die because that's just kind of how life works. you got to have a big production, you know. But it is often believed that this movie is cursed. And similar to The Exorcist, there are people out there that believe that viewing this movie uh, brings that curse on to you. Um, there's, I mean, there's hundreds of people out there that say they watched Rosemary's Baby and then... Terrible things happened to them. They had miscarriages, or they were, you know, their brother was murdered, or their baby died, or their house burnt to the ground, and just weird shit, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I picked these two for the stories because I feel that they're kind of quick and easy. They're digestible. It's yeah. easy to see where the curse comes from. But it still leaves that open-ended, is it cursed? Is it? Do we know? I don't know, man. I mean, like, uh, when it comes to, like, curses, like, do, does someone need to curse something, or are things just cursed? I, I feel like the the, ter- the term curse is kind of just, like, thrown around in that sense. That is it's a like, very good question. You know, because I feel like it maybe originated from people inflicting a curse onto a land or something or some mm. someone or something okay, okay. but you know like this was just like hey, i gotta write a scary movie it's funny you, know? you bring that like, up because the next one i have is it kind of breaks everything we just said <laughs> and it's <laughs> okay. it's a true curse <laughs> okay all right um, is it the superman curse it is not that wasn't my guess i was thinking of earlier but okay it is all not right. it is not you would you like to do your your painting yeah, it's gonna take like a minute and a half. Well, let's let's hear it. Bust yeah. it out for me. All right, so another painting. Rip uh, it out, said, whip it out, bro. It's gonna be out so long. All right, so uh, any another uh, painting said to be cursed is actually a series of collective paintings known as the Crying Boy by Italian artist Bruno Amadio. Amadio. Oh. And uh, it, it was in the 1950s, right? So the paintings were all of English orphans, like, post-World War II, I guess to kind of spread awareness of the carnage, you know? And I became one of the most popular mass-produced series of prints in England, very quickly. It wasn't until about 30 years later in the 80s that firefighters all around Europe started finding in, like, houses that were just absolutely decimated by house fires, containing the prints of the crying boy. Uh, completely untouched by the flames and always found in the same face down position. Ooh, Isn't that strange? Spooky, scary. So many believe uh, that this is due to the orphans themselves having survived survived like the tragedies of World War Two. This is further uh, backed up by multiple psychics claiming that the souls of the not so lucky orphans that perished in the war now inhabit these images. So they're okay. just like I have to have resilience in this image. Uh, so people have even gone so far as to attempt to burn the prints on purpose to see if they actually, like, repel flames. And though it's, like, there have been varying reports, obviously, these prints were all made, uh, with, like, the same run-of-the-mill, like, glossy print paper, you know, Uh that's, like, it's standard. Uh, they're reported to burn remarkably slow, if at all. Ooh. Very strange, right? So the So all these prints of the crying boy. I wonder why. I, uh, and it was like a huge thing in England only in the 80s. And then it just kind of tapered off again. Now, the skeptical side of me wants to know. I don't know if you hold this answer or if they hold this answer. Is it something to do with perhaps the material it's printed on or painted with? See, that's what I was saying. Like, it's like they're prints of the original thing. So mm-hmm. it's nothing outside of ink and paper with like that glossy tone over it. You know? see that that that's I I thought of that too and I was looking into it like what it might been what it might have been yeah, like perhaps made out of mass or, like produced printed it, on. they fucked up or something or maybe it's but, really yeah. good I don't know Yeah I mean there like I said there were varying like reports like some people were just like no it lit right up but then there's uh, like a l- alarming amount of people that were like it was like really hard to get this thing to catch on fire it's, it was super strange hmm, okay, okay And that's it the crying boy Repellent to flames, people's houses burning down. That that is strange. I, I I'm intrigued by that. I wonder. We'll post a picture of that too. Because it, it's hard to say that that's coincidental. You know. Yeah. It, it really is. It's no, it was hard. all throughout the '80s, and they were all in the same position. None of them touched by fire. Super weird. That's spooky. Super strange. 
Ugh. What do you got going on next? Okay. Is, it, is this the last movie? Yeah, what do you, you could guess. You could take your guess. Take a shot. The Crow. It is not The Crow. Fuck. Fuck. I think right, Mitch, Mitch probably think? might have an idea because he's looking at is me. Is it the At Tuck curse? It is. Oh, yeah. The At Tuck curse? Uh, I yeah, I, I it's you. You have a few of his screen, motherfucker. I don't trust no, you. It's no, at tuck, uh, a tuck, or whatever, however you'd pronounce it. At-tuck. Um, it is a book uh called the incomparable a tuck, and it is a book about an Inuit poet that travels to Toronto. They uh when they bought the script from the writer uh, Mordecai Rickler. Uh, they changed Mordecai it a little is bit. Like a cool ass name. They wanted to make it a little bit more American, so they changed it to uh, "In Alaskan Coming to New York," as opposed to an Inuit going to Toronto. Um, and essentially, it's a it's a com it's a light hearted comedy. Uh, it's about you know said person I took would uh, travel to this new place. And the way they describe it is it's a fish-out-of-water story. You know, it's someone that's brand new to the culture yeah. and the climate. A little Inuit in the big city. Yeah, learning new things, you know, making friends, being goofy. Well, there is... No one knows exactly why or how. Uh, the book was written in the 60s, so there's no... I mean, nothing weird with the book. You can buy it on Amazon. It's no problem. Just a book. Uh, but they tried to adapt this to screen, Okay. And uh, they had the wonderful idea about a decade after the book was written, and they start, you know, they get the screen, the screenplay written, and they start casting, right? And they call out to one John Belushi. Ooh. John Belushi signs on. Uh, I don't believe it was official, but he did agree to play Attuck in the movie. Uh, and then right before production could begin, he was found dead, uh, overdosed on drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Interestingly R. enough, R. this halted production for a few years. They took some time off to really step back. And, you know, just take their time. Yeah, when your main actor dies, you need a breather. So in 1986, they revive it from the dead, and they bring it back, and they offer the role to one Sam Kinison. Oh, God. Sam Kinison uh, worked on the film for eight days. He uh, was the actor. He did this. They halted production at eight days because apparently... They were having disputes because in the contract they gave Sam Kinison much more creative uh, freedom to yeah. do things with the script. So they were doing rewrites and you know getting money from the the film company thing like that. They were waiting. Uh, the week before that they were supposedly going to finalize everything, Sam Kinison was killed in a drunk driving accident. Uh, this is a little side note. This has nothing to do with the curse. I just found it to be very horrifying. Uh, I didn't know this. Sam Kinison was driving. He was sober. He was driving uh, back home in his truck, and a 17-year-old drunk driver, like, head-on collided with him and his wife. Yeah. And uh, his uh, someone was behind him. I don't remember if it was, like, a brother or a family, family member or a friend. Someone was driving behind him. So, like, after it happened, the guy jumped out of the car to, like, go see if everything was okay. And, uh... The wife got out of the car. She was fine. She had a concussion, I believe. And then Sam Kinison, like, got out of the car himself and, like, was, like, talking. But he wasn't talking to anybody. He was just looking, and he was like, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. What the fuck? And then the friend was like, dude, what do you, like, we got to, like, you know, like, come on, we got to get you to the hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then he was, like, rambling. He's like, I guess if you say so. And then he dropped dead right there on the spot. So he was completely coherent, and then he just dropped oh, dead. Oh, my God. Dude, that is terrifying. Um, it's, <laughs> it's just an entity like, you can't do this mm-hmm. movie. Um, so they they really don't waste any time. They, they mourn Sam Kinison. Not. They move on. They get John Candy. Oh, my God. How have I never heard of this before? What's the name of the movie again? Uh, At Took. Well, there, that was just what we know what they think it was going to be called. Cause it yeah. Never, cause... <laughs> never really made it out At-tuk. of like pre-production. Oh, my God. I've never heard of this. Um, So they give it to John Candy. Uh, for those of you that don't know, John Candy would later die of a heart attack. They take one more stab at this. And this, this last stab takes two people with it. Um... <laughs> So they oh fi- they're fishing for new people to work for, right? And they find the perfect guy, none other than Chris Farley. Oh, 
fuck? <laughs> Chris Farley signs Jesus. on to play at Tuck, and he dies. And you want to know what's even funnier? Because this is not talked about a lot. But it is, uh, it is like an interesting detail. His dog died of sadness. No, afterward. no, 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 no. Um, there was a supporting role in the movie who would have been the friend that Atuk would have met with. Yeah. And Chris Farley had the perfect guy in mind for this role. And he gave him a copy of the script because he was like, dude, we could do this together. And it was none other than his SNL fellow cast member, Phil Hartman, who was shot five months later by his wife, who oh, then committed suicide. Oh, my God. And with the death of Chris Farley, the movie Atuk was never to be made again. Do not mess with the Inuit culture. Don't even talk about it in film. They, <laughs> like, yeah, unless they, you're honoring it highly, do they not. They officially decided that after that, uh, n- that movie Jesus should not be Christ. made. That is a cursed <laughs> script. Jesus. Yeah. So there, I I had to say this one because there, I mean, okay, it, it's easy to say that this could be a coincidence, but there's almost no denying that there is, if you're ever going to point to if something it, being a curse, it's this. Dude, if it happens like twice, okay, mm-hmm. maybe we'll try it a th- third time's a charm. If it's, it's still happening? Yep. It Jesus fuck. It got five it, people. It got five people. Uh, well, it, uh, well, six because of the wife, but you know. Well, yeah, yeah, I guess that's true. Jesus um, yeah, so Christ. it really took its toll. Um, I I love that story. It, it's it's kind of sad dangerous because it's one of those tales where like you want more, you want to know more, but there really there isn't. really just isn't any more. It's just oh, this is just chaos that aligned perfectly terribly. Yeah, it's very matter of fact in stating that it's uh, well, the, whoever signed on to be in the movie. Or showed remote interest in being in the film, ended up dead. Dominoes, man. And Dominoes. the movie was never able to be made. So if you want to read the book, it's still out there, but uh, the movie <laughs> is not made. <laughs> Who would you imagine in your head saying all of uh, the main characters' lines? Would it would it be uh, Belushi, Farley, Candy? I'm realistically, I'm partial to John Candy. That yeah. he's he's yeah. like my he's my favorite. Oh, no, of course. He's got all the see the thing about like, Farley for certain like yelling parts. Yeah. That'd be fun. See but. the thing with Belushi and Farley, they're really good, but they're very uh energetic when it comes to their work. They're very physical and they do things that are like I mean, any time even look at Animal House. It's like John Belushi's funny, but what's funny is just the way he carries himself in that movie. Yeah. So it's hard to it's hard to see them. John Candy's perfectly rounded. He's just a funny man. Yeah, I haven't I haven't read the book or anything, but I knew about the curse. But just from you know hearing the premise, uh, you know, I imagine like the in the main character, you know, the Inuit guy would be kind of wholesome, you know, kind of like John Candy esque. Yeah. So I think I think he would he would be a good fit for the role. It is I've, just from the superficial stuff I've heard. I have heard, uh, I've heard rumor on the internet for years now that they they're trying to revive the script and bring it back, but I'm pretty sure that that's just one of those like Dude, I don't, it's like clickbait, you know? It they could happen. To read I mean, about it. Yeah, I mean, someone was crazy enough to ca- I don't know what his name is, but they're crazy enough to cast again as Superman with all that shits behind it. Yeah, yeah it's you weird. Know? Henry, we Henry not even... Cavill or whatever, he's the only one that's, like, fine. Yeah, we didn't even think to put that in there in this episode. No, it's just... See, Superman I've, curse, man. I was debating between that one and this one because they're, they're both good. But I feel that this one is just... It's right to the point. Oh, like, yeah. It is, this, it's this is like a hot knife blatant. through butter. It is just a fucking curse up the wazoo. There's nothing else to say <laughs> yeah, about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Jesus. I'm going to shift gears here to completely different. We got two left. Exiting cinema. Number one, I'm going to save the the real weird one uh, for last, but we're going to talk about the Curse of the Pharaohs. Okay. Gotcha. Now, I want it to be known right now that this is super, like, cursory. This realistically could be like a two to three part series no i'm sure it's there's that like crazy. multiple books written about this it's fucking weird but let me i'll just give you the lowdown so what i did not know um correct me if i'm wrong but uh i don't know the names of the locations but i know that akhenaten was the pharaoh previous to tutankhamen okay 
And the reason that this information is important is because I was unaware of this. Akhenaten moved the capital city to a different location. Okay? So he moved. They uprooted and left. From? Where, from wherever. I, it was somewhere in Egypt. I don't fucking know where. But it was Cairo someplace. Cairo is the only thing I know. But they uprooted and left. Now, the reason this is important is because this explains why Tutankhamun's uh, tomb took so long to find because it was not in the same location that we were expecting it to be yeah. based on the geographical move that had taken place. Now, I read that Tutankhamun moved it back, so I'm not 100%. I, don't quote me. I'm no Egyptologist. These guys are going to make up their minds. And I know there are people out there that are really into this and know way more than what I'm trying to say, so if I'm wrong, you know, don't be upset with me. But I'm pretty certain that Tutankhamun moved the capital city back. And the reason that it's different is because his tomb is not in the capital city. It is outside of the capital city. And since there's so many different digging locations based on they were here, then they were here, then they're back here, then they're over here. Yeah. It it just took forever to get to it. It's a wild goose chase, yeah. It took forever. So there's a couple key players in this, right? And you have my personal favorite, Howard Carter, okay? He is the, I guess you'd call him Egyptologist, archaeologist. Uh, he was the person that was, he was the digger, you know? Yeah, the, yeah. Um, So what happened uh, was he was digging for years, I mean years, like decades. Digging, digging, digging. And, you it know. It kind of sounds fun. He came across the. Something that symbolized uh, it with the name King Tutankhamun on it. And it was something that he was unaware of. Uh, historians at the time were unaware of the existence of this person. So he took great interest in it, obviously, and he wanted to find more information on it. Um, so he keeps digging. One day there's a bit of a kerfuffle, okay? Like on the dig site? Mm-hmm. There are some French tourists that come to the dig site, and they're very drunk. And they start fucking around, and they start doing shit they're not supposed to, okay? Yeah. So, Mr. Carter decks one of them in the fucking face, punches him right in the face. Hell yeah. However. Does he kill him? Since the French were in charge back then. Oh, no. <laughs> they He clearly could not get a free trial uh, yeah. about anything, so it looked very bad on him. Uh, Howard Carter was given two choices. He either had to apologize... Or he had to step down from his position working in the archaeological field. Why do I get the strong feeling he did not apologize? He did not. He did, he did not, did not okay. apologize. They disgraced his work. He was not happy with this. <laughs> so he doesn't have a job. He can't get hired anywhere because any archaeologist out there is working. They already have you know their dig sites that are theirs. Yeah. So this is kind of it sucks. He just does nothing. Yeah. Then introduce George Herbert Carnarvon, the fifth Earl of Carnarvon. <laughs> Carnarvon. <laughs> he is an individual. He his story is kind of cool. That's what. That's why I'd like to do an episode on this because the personalities in this are very interesting. All right, all right. But uh, Carnarvon, he uh, he was a bit of a party animal. You know, he liked to hang out. He liked to have fun. He was a John Belushi type. Uh, the the thing that I heard, I read this from a couple different places, so I'm thinking it's true. Uh, he was a bit of a, a speedster, is what they called him. He was an adrenaline junkie. And oh, I he, thought he was just snorting speed. He could be seen driving around Europe at the whopping speed of 20 miles an hour in his car. Okay? Uh, so this guy's of unchained speed. Oh, yeah, it's way back time. in the day. Okay. Autobahn, man. No rules. He, yeah. And no rules. One day he gets in a very bad car accident, which leaves him... <laughs> With lingering <laughs> injuries. An hour. And part of these injuries meant that the cool, damp climate in England was not beneficial for him. So he spent his winter months in Cairo, down there in the heat, living it up in the sun. Gotta have that dry heat. And since it's relatively boring for you know a rich individual to be in Cairo at the time, he took a great interest in Egyptology. And he began studying and blah, blah, blah. And he had all this money, so he wanted to dig. He wanted to dig. He needed a team, though. 
and he couldn't get any real archaeologists to do it because they were all currently under all contract working, and yeah, working. Yeah. So this is how he meets Howard Carter, who's arguably one of the best in the business, but he's blackballed, so he's free. He's got all the time in the world. Yeah, yeah. He was disenfranchised by the French. So these two hook up. They get their funding, and they get a plot of land that nobody else has access to. It's only theirs to dig in, and it's all of them. So they build a team, right? They're digging. Sadly, World War One happens, and you know Howard Carter has to leave to go join the war. Yeah, not ideal. So he does that, and then afterwards he comes back refreshed and ready to dig. <laughs> Fresh from the trenches. Now, obviously, there's you know there's a lot of life that happens in between this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they were a good pair. Uh, George Herbert and Howard Carter were they were interesting because they were very competitive with each other. So they would kind of fight to be the one to find new things, which led them to discovering a lot because they were working hard to impress yeah, each other. Yeah, it's like Paul and John fucking trying to outright each other. So um, they Howard Carter finds the tomb of Tutankhamun, okay? And this is in November of 1922. Um, he was, what was it? Howard Carter was given a canary as a gift by George Herbert. Okay. It, okay. It, it, this plays into it in a minute. Yeah, Canary. So, he immediately writes to George Herbert and says, "You need to get down here. Like we found it. We're going we got to open the shit. You got to be here like tonight." Mm -hmm. So, they get the word out, right? Uh when he goes back to his house, Howard Carter, he finds that the canary he had been gifted was eaten by a cobra in the cage. In the canary cage was a cobra that had oh eaten God. the bird. Bad omen. Okay, bad omen. Uh, yeah, probably not good. So, on November 29th of 1922, they open the tomb, okay? Obviously, they find a bunch of crazy shit. There's supposedly that thing that says, like, you know, if you disturb the tomb of Tutankhamun, you will be cursed. I'm not sure if that's Hollywood or if that's kind of realistic. I don't know. Yeah. But, why don't we get into a little bit of what happened here, okay? Okay. The tomb is opened. Hooray. History is altered forever. The roaring 20s. Everyone's <laughs> dancing like flappers. We now understand the new, you know, we, there's new pharaohs we didn't know existed. It's all a great big thing. George Herbert, the fifth Earl of Carnarvon. Um... <laughs> He died on April 5th of 1923. Oh, he was okay. bitten by a mosquito while in Egypt. Then he was shaving and happened to nick that mosquito bite, causing a terrible infection, and he died four months and seven days after opening the tomb. Yeah, you never see it coming, do you? Then. What a crazy way to die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so stupid. Yeah. Then we have George J. Gold the first. He was one of the first visitors to the tomb, okay? He died in the French Riviera on May 16, 1923, of an extreme fever immediately after his visit. Fair enough. All right. A.C. Mace was a member of Howard Carter's excavation team. He died from arsenic poisoning in 1928. Jesus. Then we get into Captain the Honorary Richard Berthall. This was uh, Howard Carter's secretary, okay? okay? all right. On November 15th, 1929, he died in his bed a in a Mayfair club. He was the victim of a suspected smothering. Oh, my God. Now, some argue this both ways. Now, Howard Carter, he was the one that was there when the tomb was opened. He was the excavator. Yeah. He was pretty much the, the big guns. He just didn't have the funding. Uh, he died in 1939, so well over a decade after the opening of the tomb. Uh, but some people see this as he did die sort of young, and perhaps it's related to the curse of the pharaoh. Yeah, it's kind of just shoehorned in there, though. Yeah, it's just it, it fits it fits the scheme. Yeah. But so that is the curse of the pharaoh. Obviously, damn, that's are, like crazy. <laughs> I didn't know that there was so much lore behind it and all the characters. There are plenty of different uh, stories, renditions of other people 
But these are the base facts of we know who was involved and what happened to that them. That honestly sounds like such a good movie. Like, there's this guy who's down on his luck, out of the job. There's a rich man who needs to recover from his speed demon activities. A and they bit. all meet together and they get cursed and like, oh, I can't believe we did this. World War One happens in the middle there. That's why like, it's an interesting story because there, there's a lot of personality to it. I mean, yeah, really yeah, the only sure. reason that Howard Carter was able to discover it was because he got fired for being so stubborn. And because yeah. of that firing, it led him to getting funding to dig in a different location of which he found the tomb he was looking for. Validating so his entire just, life. It all kind of, it, it was almost like faded that way. Like that's yeah. what needed to happen. Definitely. Mitch yeah. Mitch has a conspiracy, a conspiracy. for us. Hear it. I like this. So there's a conspiracy theory about the whole, you know, finding Tutankhamun's tomb. Uh, so essentially, the idea of the conspiracy theory is that, uh, uh, what's his name, Carter? Howard Carter. Yeah, Howard Carter actually mocked up, you know, a tomb. So essentially, he, you know, they, they he kills that, everyone. <laughs> yeah, he kills everyone. Essentially, people speculate that they actually found the tomb of Ak- Akhenaten's wife. Okay, okay. And they mocked it up and used, like, spare parts to make it look like a pharaoh's tomb. So that, you know, making it look like, you know, Tutankhamun's tomb, whatever. Which would give more push to the curse. Yeah, that could be more of why... They fuck with why, the dead. Yeah, that could yeah. be more of why there's a curse than there just being a curse. So, I don't know, I just thought of that. I like that, that's interesting. So that is... Mitch has Curse. always been the Egypt guy. He has, yeah. That's why I'm I'm glad I got those right because I know you would have corrected me if no, I was yeah, wrong. Oh yeah, yeah. You are so, checks and balances I, with the it, Egypt it, stuff. I'll tell you what, I'm interested in the Egypt stuff, but when you're trying to read it, it's fucking hard. Some of the names, it's like you got to keep track of this guy and this person and, and this. These, it's like yeah, and all these very, ley lines and technology. They're and very complex names, yeah. and uh, it's very <laughs> hard for me. It's, like it's kind of like Shakespeare, you know. There's it's like, four, ooh. count them, four X's in this name. Like, that's crazy. Okay. Right, we into the big guns now? What is yep. this? What is this? This is the Curse of the Hope Diamond. Now, ooh. I had never been made aware of this before, but it is, it's weird, okay? <laughs> it's cursed as fuck. It's very weird. So, in 1666... Baptiste Tavernier stole a 115.16 carat diamond from the statue of the Hindu. Or it was of the statue of a Hindu goddess named Sita. Okay. Okay. Now the people that worshipped at this temple supposedly had put a curse on the individual who took the diamond. Okay, because this was like their prized possession. This was what they wanted all along. This guy supposedly died of a terrible fever, and when his fever killed him, his corpse was ripped apart by dogs. <laughs> Completely ripped apart oh by dogs, okay? Man, the past is so scary. It disappeared for a while. No one saw it for a while. His like, body? No, the diamond. Well, his body too, though, right? Yeah, yeah, it yeah, took a minute. Yeah, yeah. But the diamond disappeared, and when it resurfaces, it had been cut to make it undefinable by the human eye. So now it was a 67 carat diamond, okay? And this diamond was given given to King Louis the Ninth. Okay? All of the king's male children and female children for that matter died and he died of gangrene. Okay? So more people are dead. Gross. It disappeared for slightly longer. And then the next person to own it was Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette? All these Louis. Um, we know how that one ended, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, he cut her head off. Uh, he he's dead. You know, everything bad happened. He killed a lot of women. Death. Mm. Okay. After their death, it was believed to be stolen by somebody close to them, and it was cut to a forty-five carat diamond as a way to keep it, you know, a little bit more compact and hidden. Yeah, it just whittles it down. Okay. Um, so this is how it got its name, because in 1893, the 45-carat diamond version of the Hope Diamond was discovered by a man named Thomas Hope, 
Okay. Now, there's nothing really known about what had happened to Thomas Hope. Um, we it's kind of believed that the curse had no real effect on him per se. Yeah. But uh, there's differing reports out there. There's people that say you know he died or his daughter died. Blah blah blah. I, uh, the, everyone dies. I mean. For the purposes of this, I don't think the curse affected him as far as I could uh, ascertain. I yeah, did not figure that out. That's why his name got put on it. Yeah. So. It was gone, and it was recut one final time. After John Hope? Yeah, after after the Hope fa- Thomas Hope. After Thomas the Hope, Hope family had All these it. just names. And, and now, ooh, it went to the Dutch jeweler that had cut it, named William Falls. And his son murdered him and stole the diamond from him. <laughs> I thought you were going to say he fell. Nope, he stole and murdered. Uh, he murdered him it. and stole the diamond. Do you get it? Hendrick, the one that stole the diamond, committed suicide. Oh. Now here we go. We have another owner, a Greek merchant by the name of Simon Manashardis. He drove off a cliff, perishing with his wife and son. Terrible. Then it appears in the hands of famed jeweler Pierre Cartier, who you might know as the creator of Cartier. <laughs> you know, I don't know what Cartier is. Really, it's no, a big. Uh, it's like a, they have like fragrances and shit now. It's like Cartier. I don't have expensive things. Um, and okay, so he wanted to sell it to the American heiress Evelyn Walsh McLean. Okay. Um, she was supposedly not interested in purchasing this diamond. She said it looked a little gaudy and tacky, and she wasn't a fan. So what Cartier did was he put some lore behind it. He told her the stories of what happened to all the people that wore it and how it was evil and maybe cursed. Wait, he put the lore, or he informed her of the past? Who knows? Oh. Who knows? Oh, that's all right. However, okay. she accepts. She takes it, Okay. She takes it. She purchases it. She's into that it. kind of thing. Uh-huh. She regularly wore the diamond. Uh, some reports even say that she had a special collar created so that her great Dane could wear it when she didn't feel like wearing it. That's awesome. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's so cool. Ooh, okay, so first her mother-in-law dies, then her nine-year-old son. Then her husband leaves her for another woman before ending up in a mental hospital where he kills himself. Oh, my God. <laughs> At 25, McQueen's daughter died of a drug overdose. And she lost her business. She lost everything. And she died with no money. Her entire family was taken from her. Her life was ruined. Her business, her money, everything was destroyed. God. Her life was fucking ruined. And I assume the Great Dane died, too. I'm sorry to say it. What a sad immortality did. she has now in history. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Damn. The last owner of the Hope Diamond was Harry Winston. And Harry Winston was a little bit different. Harry Houdini. (laughs) Harry Winston was a slightly different story because what he did is he took it out on tour. He toured it around the country and let other people come and look at the Hope Diamond. All well and good. One day he decides, you know, he's had enough of it. He doesn't want it, and he thinks it should be in a museum. So he offers to send it to the Smithsonian. Smithsonian gladly accepts. They say, we'll take it. That's perfectly fine. Nice. So funny enough, uh, he FedExes it to the Smithsonian. <laughs> and Man, I'm afraid to send like a $20 bill in the mail. No, and they say uh, what ha- they charge, it was uh, $2 for stamps, $13 to send it, and then the insurance on the package was over a million dollars because of what it was. You got to get the package insurance, I guess. Okay. Right, so he gets rid of it, right? Yeah. Well, his wife dies as soon as he gets rid of God it. God damn. Well, is, it, is it like a postpartum thing? Is it just like, ah. It's not over yet. Oh, God. His wife dies. Yeah. His leg gets horribly crushed and mangled in a work accident. Oh, my God. What is it? Oh. His house burns to the ground. <laughs> and then when moving into a new house, somebody strangles his dog. What? <laughs> It's not funny. It's not funny. <laughs> it's just like, what the fuck? And that they is... They strangled his dog? Yep, that is the curse of the Hope Diamond. And ever since then, it has been sitting in the Smithsonian Museum. Oh, my God. 
How well, fuck? And it, it, I had no it's idea. It's a four hundred year old diamond. I just knew it was a killed, thick ass diamond. It I has just, killed countless people man. over and over and over again, and over again. Did you hear that part? Oh yeah, it just keeps going. <laughs> that, I wonder who's who the next uh, the next victim is. I don't know, but I don't want to be the guy. You think the Smithsonian will burn down? That, you know how like devastating that would be <laughs> to the world. Like, love America or yeah. hate America, yeah. there is some really important shit in there. It'd you be know, like a, <laughs> be like if you backed up into Stonehenge and it all just toppled like, over. Oh damn it! So, like, he's ah, it back up. It's like no, we can't figure out how they did it in the first place. <laughs> but yeah, so that is the curse of the whole uh, diamond. Jesus. Now I will tell you this: I think that this is. Um, you know, depending on how uh, our listeners out there, if you guys enjoy this episode, or if you don't enjoy it, please let us know. Because uh, when doing this research, I came across a lot more curses. So much stuff is cursed. And there's it's a lot stupid. of cool shit out there. So this could very easily be uh, something we come back to Running in the theme. future. Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of nice, you know. Cause it is. You get a little bit of history, you get a little bit of lore, and a lot of story. You know, yeah, everything you realize is weird. A lot of shit shouldn't be fucked with. But yeah, that um, that is the episode on the curses. curses. How about that? Curses. One? Yeah. I'm even gonna go. With You're th- cursed. You're cursed. Yeah, everybody's cursed. We're all cursed. We uh, th- I gotta say, Fuck. this was a lot of fun. I really liked this. I liked it as well. Um. So yeah, definitely let us know uh, if we should, if you guys want to hear this again, because I would love to. Uh, I'd love to dive into some more curses. They're kind of fun. Yeah. Also, silence. We're just going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah, if, if, we, you don't if say we get anything. silence, not the silence we just experienced. That was good silence. It I was. thought you were asking me to be silent. That's why I didn't say it. Like, okay. <laughs> you thought I was like, silence, Grant. Yeah, I, was like, <laughs> like, I guess you got like, something to say. I don't so know. So aggressive. Like, that's, that was rude, but okay. But no, yeah. Uh, tell us what you whatever you wanted to tell us. Yeah, absolutely. At startacult at gmail.com. Hell, yeah, also, we will be back next week. If yeah. you want to check out our Patreon episodes, they are all on our Patreon where you can donate $5 a month and you can have access to all of our episodes that we've done there exclusively. You're going to get and a shirt. all the new ones. Is the shirt the higher tier? I'm going to tell you what. Do I just keep saying the shirt comes with everything and that's not the case? I'm going to tell you what. If I you, feel like we should just give the shirts to everyone. I, that's what I'm thinking. If you're if you're at least a five dollar patron and you do it for more than one month, if you get two months in, we're gonna give you a shirt. Yeah. Probably. I don't think you'd cancel for no reason, but we will gladly give you a shirt. Because we we really appreciate the support. You yeah, know? we do. We should just edit the the page. No, to make that no, thing. I don't no. want them to. I don't want right. them to know this. This All is right. a hot button verbal deal. deal, verbal handshake right now. That's going to be the deal. Yeah, and uh, seriously, you if folks. you guys, uh, if you want a shirt, uh, you know, you can either buy one directly from us, or uh, you know, let us know. We'll find the best way to get it to you. No problem. We've sent uh, we sent a shirt across the country already, so we're we're in the business. True, we've you sent know, out a there. few shirts. Yeah, we uh, we've been been making it work. So. Let us know what size you are, and we'll uh, get you on your way. How about that? Yeah, and where's all that? There's a link below, mm-hmm. okay? So you follow us on all the shit, but there's also a link below to the Patreon. But follow us on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and we also have a YouTube. We have that up there. You can stream us anywhere. You know that you're listening. Uh, hey, yeah, and start a call at gmail.com just with your thoughts. Please We do. want them. We love you all. Have a great week. Goodbye.